okay? Then y'all are going to stand up and shout it, and we're going to sit down and whisper, okay? Look, I want y'all to look at these kids. They're full of energy tonight. Well, it's an honor and privilege to be here tonight, and the adults need to show the kids they're just as excited to be here as the kids are. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, kids, y'all ready? Sing, shout, okay? It says shout. Y'all got to shout. Ready? Stand up and shout it if you love my Jesus. Stand up and shout it if you love my Lord. I want to know. Sit down and whisper if you love my Lord. I want to know, I want to know if you love my Lord. Stand up. Stand up and shout it if you love my Jesus. Stand up and shout it if you love my Lord. I want to know. Sit down and whisper if you love my Jesus. Sit down and whisper if you love my Lord. I want to know, I want to know if you love my Lord. Their first bear hug. 
And so they are going to get some green apples for their vest. All right, Aubrey and Reagan, come on. Can you tell me your verse you had to learn? What was it? Do y'all remember? Any sweet dear saint that can sew and would like to sew these patches on these babies' vests would be greatly appreciated if you can come and see me or Christy or Tracy um, whenever you can and sew those on because we can't do that. <laughs> um, okay, and TNT, Miss Kaylee, can you come up here, please? brag on Miss Kaylee a minute. She um, joined us in TNT some last year and didn't get to complete it with us all the way through, but we're glad she's back this year, and she completed her um, Start Zone book in one week. Um, it usually generally takes at least two, and she was able to say all her verses in one week, so we're super proud of her. So she gets her t-shirt and her book. <laughs> all right, guys, and we are about $330 towards our goal of 500 The kids are super excited about that as well. So um, they're ready to do the penny march if the adults are ready for them. your question. What if those kids only come one time and then they never get to go to church again? What are they going to remember tonight? You think they'll remember that song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know? In a dark day of their life when everything, you know, they've forgotten about everything else. One of these days they might look back at this night and say, you know what, I ain't got nothing else, but they told me down at church that Jesus loves me through that little song and maybe that'll make an impression in their life. And so many more things that God's going to do. I just believe in for it. I'm grateful and thankful for those young folk being here and us older folk also. And we're excited to be here. Let's stand, if you would, and we'll shake hands with each other. And I believe 
And Lisa is going to come and sing for us here in just a little bit. Shake hands with the uh, loved ones bes beside you. Sunday deacons meeting at five o'clock, men's meeting at six o'clock, and next Wednesday night a regular scheduled business meeting. Uh, November the fifteenth, uh, Sunshiners luncheon at one o'clock. Then also Thanksgiving week that Wednesday night, uh, we'll roll that service back to the Tuesday night. Don't forget about that; it'll be in a bulletin also on Sunday, and so you'll know um, instead of coming to church on that Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, we'll come on Tuesday night. That'll give y'all ladies plenty of time to spend cooking and all that stuff and calling the preacher and getting him to come over for dinner and make sure you got plenty of time for that and all that. 
But uh, we'll just roll that back to that Tuesday night, and uh, we'll have Wednesday night off to do what you need to do if you're going out of town and all that. And so we'll have a Thanksgiving service that night, a great opportunity to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good one. Good one. Uh, <laughs> Sunshiner's basket. Also, also the twenty seventh. This. Can you believe? Can you believe that this is November? This is amazing. Time is flying by. We're getting closer to we get to see Jesus. And even when kids or kids are now saying, I can't believe how quick time is passing. When I was a kid, time went slow. The days would never end. But now kids are seeing how fast time is going. We're wide open toward the rapture of the church. And I'm excited about that. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Somebody said on the church sign, I saw it today, it said, uh, uh, even so, come quickly, Jesus, before the election. <laughs> A little bit late for that, but uh, God's had His hand in this thing, and let's pray. Let's continue to pray. We prayed the other night that God would give us the, uh, the one with the least judgment upon our nation, and I believe God has done that. I believe God's hand is upon it, and so let's continue to pray uh, for Mr. Trump, and let's pray that God will turn this country around. We've got a stronghold in the Senate, stronghold in, in the House, and so uh, let's really pray for our country, and God can do that. I believe He can, and He will if we get to the place where we desire that. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll, we'll receive our tithes, tithes and offer at this time. We'll go forward with the service. Good to have these young men jumping up here and doing that. Brother Max, if you would. Lord, thank you, Lord, for coming to your house here again, Lord. Please bless the Word of God. Please bless the offer, Lord. Please put your waving hands around this church, Lord, and help this church. Yes, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? You practice something, you get to church, and then you have to figure out how to do it. God's amazing grace sent down from heaven, rescued me from death and from shame, opened up.
be holding to my hand when I cross this river. He will take the sting of death away. Tis so sweet to know I have Jesus with me. He will keep me from sin and from strife. He delivered me from condemnation. Now I have eternal life. Now I know that he is mine and I'm his forever. He is leading me along life's way. He'll be holding to my hand as I cross this river. He will take the sting of death my hand as I cross this river. He will take the sting of death away. We had a, a preacher to take when I fell off the roof in 2013 and, and banged myself all up and was not physically able to pastor the church in Sasser. They got a, a young man there that had never pastored before. And he was in Sunday school one morning as I was teaching. And I was given the illustration of justification and sanctification. You know, most Baptists hear those two words and they just kind of over here. Or they go in and out over there. You know, and I, I illustrated it this way. I said, justification. Just if I had never sinned. Justification. Don't ever say it any other way. Well, after he become the after you know he got to preaching, he was preaching and he said justification. And he looked back at me and he said, I got that from Brother Weiss. Let me tell you something. If you want freedom, it's just as if you had never sinned. God don't care where you've been. He wants to know where you're going, and he will give you this eternal life. And, and you know, and we, we're rejoicing today over the election, that's true. But look, rejoice, Jesus Christ said, because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Listen to this last verse. This song was written by G.T. Spear. And a wonderful man, wonderful old Christian man from, from Mississippi. And then he moved to Alabama and had a school there. But anyway, look. Listen to the last words of this verse, chorus, as this, of this song as we sing it again. Tis so sweet to know I have Jesus with me. He will keep me from sin and from strife. He delivered me from condemnation. Now I have eternal life. Now I know that he is mine and I'm his forever. He is leading me along life's way. He will kill you. Hey! 
Amen. Appreciate that good singing. It's always good to know that we have Jesus with us. We'll dismiss our teens at this time. And those of us that are alive and remain, you'll be in the service. If you would, turn your Bibles to Psalms chapter 46. Psalms chapter number 46. Thank you for being here. I know it's a challenge on Wednesday evening. It is for me. I know what it is for you. Many times you put off supper. Many times you put off things to get here. But you come anyway against against the fight of Satan and what he had like to stop you from doing. You come and being so faithful to God's house. I'm grateful and thankful for that. I'm glad there's still people that love to come to God's house. I'm glad there's still people that love and put that extra effort in uh, to uh, to uh, just to show the Lord that that what I say is real. Amen. Amen. Psalms 46, verse number 8 through verse number 10. Let me give you the thought God placed upon my heart yesterday. I'll try to be a help to you. The Bible says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease under the ends of the earth. He uh, breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariots in the fire. Listen to verse number 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. I want to preach this thought on the first part of verse number 10 where it says, Be still and know that I am God. I want to preach this thought. Be still and know that you ain't God. Be still and and know that you or I ain't God. You say, what do you mean by that? We'll get into that in just a minute. And uh, it'll help you, I believe, as it helped me as I studied over this. It's a real eye-opener. The sooner we find out that we ain't God, the better it's going to be for us. been said before that there is a God and we ain't Him. Uh, as we look at the Scripture here, the Bible says, Be still, know that I am. The Lord says that I am God. And it's good to know, and when we get done with this and we look at this, I believe you'll, you'll be glad to say it's good to know that I ain't God. It's good to know that God knows that I'm not God. Along with me not knowing, God knows that I'm not. And that's a good thing. You might be thinking, that that's bad. <laughs> but it's a good thing that God knows we ain't and we know that we ain't. But as we look at that, on that subject of knowing that we ain't God, we ain't got things figured out, we're not Him. We don't look through eyes like he looks. We don't think like him. Nothing about us really is like him except for the spirit of God that lives within us and sometimes that spirit that he has placed within us has a challenge getting us to move the direction he wants us to go with that very same spirit. I remember my pastor many years ago used to say, my problem's not sin getting in me. My problem's not the devil that's in the world. My problem is that man that I shave every morning and that's my problem too. But as we look at the Scripture, I want to give you some thoughts tonight on that subject. Be still and know that you ain't God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's look at what the Word says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In verse number 13. Let's say first of all that God don't expect you to be something that you're not. It's good to know that we're not God because God don't expect us to be something that were not. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 13 says, And now abide of faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these things are charity. As we find here in the Word of God, what we call the love chapter, the, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is that chapter that speaks about love and, tells, uh, and tells us exactly what lo- true love really is. As I think about a lot of things going on in my life and I think about what love is, and the Bible says here that we... Uh, we should have faith and hope and charity. But the greatest beyond uh, charity, uh, beyond faith and hope, is the word love or charity. And uh, we can let down our guard tonight and understand that there, God doesn't expect us to be something that we're not. He doesn't expect us to be what He is. He expects us to do what's right. He don't hold us to a standard to try to be just like Him. And we can let down our guard and say, huh, whew, I'm glad. <laughs> 
God don't expect me to be God. He expects me to be Levon. He expects you to be uh, who you are. And I'm glad that He expects me to be what He wants me to be. I'm not necessarily compl- uh, uh, expecting people to be more like me or me to be more like you. I just want to be what God wants me to be, and I want you to be what God wants you to be. But as we look at the Scripture here, the Bible says there, and now abide a faith, hope, and charity. The word church, uh, uh, faith here means a reliance upon Christ, a constancy in your profession. And these are three key essentials to the Christian life of doing what God wants you, wants you to do. Many times we ask and say, God, what would you have me to do? These are three things that he wants us to have and to do is faith. Be a person of faith that's relying upon Christ and also consistent in your, uh, in your profession. Being steadfast in what you believe and what Christ has done in your life is one of the things he wants you to be. And God don't expect us to be anything else. That's good relief. It's good to know that God don't expect us to live up to other people's standards. It's good to know that God don't expect us to live like uh, uh, our greatest hero or anything like that. God wants us to live up to His standard for us and basically rely upon Him and be consistent in our profession and just keep telling people that Jesus Christ is King of Kings. Not only that, it says hope. Hope, the word hope here means waiting on with pleasure or with confidence. And we can... We can have faith and then we should have hope to be waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ with pleasure. Waiting for the coming of the Savior. That's a good place to be. And then he goes on to say charity. The greatest of these is charity. The word charity, it, means, it, it, it simply means the affection or benev- benevolence, what we would call love. You think about benevolence, you think about when somebody passes away, how you come alongside them and, and console uh, console their loved ones and you, you befriend them, you try to do whatever it takes uh, to get that, that feeling of expressing. Nobody knows what to say at funerals, right? Anybody got every, everything to say? And I, things I hesitate a lot of the years, like, man, I taught myself out of going to funerals because I didn't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Nobody knows what to say when you go to a funeral, right? You just go and you pass on that charity or that benevolence that you have on the inside. And when you look in somebody's eyes, you shake their hand. They know that you're there for them. That's that's benevolence. That's love. That's charity. Is expressing what you feel on the inside. Many times I've asked myself a lot this week. I've asked myself, what is true love? What is true? What is true love or charity? How would you define true love or charity? If it's the greatest of these, if it's greater than holding fast your your profession and waiting with earnesty till the Lord comes back, what is so great or what is this thing called charity, benevolence, or love? What makes love? I mean, what, what, what is it that this word charity is? You ever had that person that says, Well, I sure love you. And then later on, you turn around and they're not there. Is that love? Or you find that person that says, Oh, I sure care so much of you. You're so precious. I just love you to death. And then you got a knife in your back. <laughs> and then you think, I thought, I thought they said they loved me. I thought, what is, what is love? What is charity? How do you prove charity? Sincerely. Jesus says it's so much farther than these. What is it? You know what it is? It's a love that don't change till death. Well, when we marry somebody, we marry our spouse, we say to, to death do us part. You know what true charity is and true love is? It's shown, it's not just told, it's shown until death. When I said I do to my wife, I meant for life, and I want to die before we separate. Now, she's probably not so content on that, it's so con- uh, got so much conviction on that. She's probably looking for an escape right, right now. But, but what is love? Love 
stays love all the way to death. He and a brother were talking today, and uh, we're talking about this very subject of love. How do you know? How do you know that somebody truly loves? In my family, we say every time somebody leaves, <laughs> here's a good illustration. It just come. Every time somebody leaves in my family, we say, "All right, we'll see you later. Love you." Now, Andrew's family is totally different. They don't say nothing. They'll never say that. You won't hear them say. You hear them say they love you. It's it's at a funeral or you're in the hospital, something serious. But in my family, it was, "Hey, see you later. Love you." But you know what? They won't call you during the year. You won't even see them during the year. You won't even hear from them during the year. The only time you see them is the next fight. I mean, the next family reunion. <laughs> is that love? Love is exemplified. It's it's shown, and it loves. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, this same chapter says, "The love loveth at all." times even through differences even through things going on love is there it's good to know that I ain't God because I'm not expected to be like something that I'm not look with me if you would to 1 Peter chapter 4 1 Peter chapter 4 verse number 11 This was enlightening to me. It might not make a whole lot of sense to you, but I'm, be still and know that we're not God because God don't expect you to do something you cannot do. God don't expect us to do something that we cannot do. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 11, the Bible says, If any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praised and dominion forever and ever. God gives the ability to do what we do, right? And so if God, if you've asked God the ability, you know, I could ask God tonight and say, God, would you give me the ability to play that piano? I've always looked at those things with amazement. they got all those keys, and I can't even get one of those guitars or four strings moving in the right direction. But you look at that, 60, is it 66 keys or how many? 88, it's even more than what I thought. 88 keys on that thing. And, and, and God could if He wanted to, but He don't expect me to sit down and play just like somebody else can do. And neither does God expect us to do things that He's not told us to do or even to, to measure up to people's means or like people think. God don't expect us to do something we cannot do. There's problems in our life that you just can't fix and I just can't fix. There's things that we face that, that we cannot change and we can't do. It's good to know that God, God realizes that I'm not God. It's good to know that. It's good to know that I'm not God because there's things I want to fix that I just can't fix and God understands that I can't. It's good to know that I'm not God. When, when playing ball, you've heard coaches say, give me 110%, son. I've always had a problem with that. How do you do that? Y'all ever thought about that? How do you give 110%? You're dying on the ball field. You're dying on the court. You've run your legs off, sweat's pouring like buckets of water off of you, and the coach looks at you, give me 110%. 10%, son, let's go. Step it up. I'm dying here. <laughs> There's no way for me to get any, do any better. I'm already giving you that. There's no logical, there's no physical way that you can give 110%. No way. You say, well, you just, he, what he's saying is give a little bit more. Well, if you give a little bit more, that means you wouldn't give 100% in the first place. You were given 90, and so he wants you to give 100%. You can't give 110%. You can only give 100%. If you step it up, that means you were slacking off a while ago. But the good thing is about God that he don't expect us to do 110%. Like our coaches, even like other believers think, he only wants 100 
percent from you and I. It's good to know that God don't expect me to do things that I cannot do. You know what God needs is just an empty vessel that He can put the ability inside us and use us like He wants to use us. Not only that, you'll find in 2 Chronicles, look in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles. It's good to know that I'm not God and you're not God because God don't expect us to be something we're not. He don't expect us to do something we can't. And God don't expect us to fight our own battles. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said, Hearken ye all of Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle, <laughs> what does it say? Is not yours. Whose is it? But it's God. Ain't it good to know tonight that God don't expect us to fight every battle, that the battle is the Lord. It brings us great comfort tonight to be able to sit back and say, you know what, this battle, it's not mine anyway. It's God's battle. And it's good to know tonight that I'm not God, and He is, and He says the battle is His, and He's going to fight the battles, and it's all in His hand. And what had happened in Jehoshaphat's life that in verse number 2, there was a messenger come to Jehoshaphat and told him, said, there's a great multitude coming beyond the sea, this side of Syria, and behold, they are in uh, Hazanon, Tamar, which is in Gedi. In they're, stretched, they're stretched from one place to the other, and they're coming your way, Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Verse number 12, he says this, O God, this is what Jehoshaphat prays, O God, will thou not judge them? Will you not deal with them for? We have no might. We, we ain't got a chance, God. Against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. I don't even have a clue what to do, but our eye, I like that. I got a little bump from the Holy Ghost on that one. <laughs> neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you or thee. He said, I, I'm looking at this multitude. I'm seeing this multitude coming this way and there's no way that we can do what we need to do with the crowd that we got. We're looking at this, this great company that's coming toward us and I don't know what to do, but he says, but I tell you what, <laughs> my eyes upon thee, Lord. Jehoshaphat understood that the battle wasn't him. He understood that he's not God and he wouldn't expect it to defeat that great army. Because you know what? The battle was the Lord's. Jehoshaphat wasn't God. And I don't know what you're facing tonight, but you're not God and neither am I. And the battle is the Lord. Our eyes just need to be fixed on Him, on thee, as the Scripture says. Sometimes in a believer's life, those fiery darts of Satan come one right after another. Almost sometime you just it's like you're standing, you've seen those movies where they line somebody out with a firing squad and they put them in the center or tie them to a stake and all of a sudden they everybody starts shooting at one time and the guy's body's just racked every which way by the shots. And sometimes as a believer, it feels just like that. It's like the shots don't quit. The punches don't quit. The jabs don't quit. And you're tossed here and there with no help, it seems like. But the battle is the Lord. He's the one that fights our battles. And sometimes that's all you can do is just back up and say, go ahead and hit me, boys. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, this spiritual warfare, I'm going, I got me a Kevlar jacket I'm going to start putting on and wearing all the time. You know what? The Word of God says that we have a spiritual armor, the breastplate of righteousness. Our loins are girt about. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. And the only time we can get killed is if we turn and run because there's nothing protecting our back. 
Sometimes all you can do when the, when the battle is raging and the, and the darts are coming, just to stand and face it and say, go ahead. I'm not going to run. Go ahead. Jab again, shoot away, but I'm not going to turn around. You know why? Because the battle is the Lord's. It might seem like that in your life. You think, I'm not getting nowhere. It seems like I'm taking shots. It seems like things are just continuing to go wrong in my life. Just let, let me tell you something. Just keep standing where you're at. Just keep standing where you're at and holding your spot and holding the fort because the, the battle is the Lord and we're not God. The only tool that we have of defense is the B I B L E. And that's the only defense that we need. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but mm mm. Mm mm. Not this. So I got my armor on. The, the darts are coming. I got the Word of God in my hand. And they ain't nothing, nothing's going to overtake us because I got my sword and the Lord's doing the fight. I'm just holding the book, holding the sword. Amen. And as long as we're close to this book, he'll take care of our battle. It's good to know tonight that we're not God because God don't expect us to fight our own battles. The Lord will show you ever fought that major battle in your life and you think, I ain't never faced nothing like this and there's no way I'll get through this? <laughs> you remember that battle? Everybody's had one. <laughs> but where you at tonight? Still fighting? Still here? Still pressing on? Not only that, Psalms 23. Let me give you one more. Psalms 23 God, we're not God, so God don't expect us to know the end of His leading. God don't expect us to know exactly where we're going beforehand. We're not God. Wouldn't it be easy? Wouldn't it be awesome if we knew the end from the beginning like He does? But look what the Word says. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, my pastor. We talked about that last week. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. Why? Why does he do it? For his name's sake. God don't expect us to know the end of his leading beforehand. He just expects us to listen to his lead. I was thinking about it today. <laughs> what if we knew? What if, what if foresight was as good as hindsight? Wouldn't that be wonderful? We can look back and say, man, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have done this or I'd done that. Look at your life. Man, we'd, <laughs> we'd relive everything. I'd go back and change this truth. This, if we was probably still back there, we'd still do the same thing. Silly, silly mistakes, right? But could you imagine if we saw in the future how we can look back and see in the past what we would see in the future? <laughs> how wonderful that would be? But you know what? God doesn't give us that insight. God don't expect us to have vision like He has vision. Do you know what we do? Step by step, day by day, walk by walk, hour by hour, we try to live this thing out and feel. That's why they call it a journey because it's a feel through life to try to go the right direction and do the right thing that you think that God wants you to do day by day. And God understands when we don't get everything right because we can't see like He sees. Ain't that good to know? That when we mess up, when we stumble and don't go the right direction, God understands that we're not God. He sees it all, but we can't. I heard a, Lance told me about a guy that he worked with. He was talking to his teenage son. You had know teenagers, they know everything, right? <laughs> Y'all remember that day when you were teenagers and knew it all, but I don't know where all that went to. <laughs> He said to his son, he said, son, in 20 years you think you'll be smarter than what you are right now? He said, absolutely, daddy. The daddy looked at him and said, that's exactly where I'm at. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> we can't exactly see it until we're there, right? 
But God sees it there and He understands that we cannot see it. But sometimes you just go. <laughs> if, you could, if you could see what's going to take place, can you imagine? There wouldn't be no lotteries. And I'm not speaking for lotteries at all. But if, 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 you, if foresight was as good as hindsight, there would be no lotteries. You know why? Because the people that saw foresight, they would see what the number is, right? They would know exactly what to put down. But the problem with that would be the people that run the lotteries would also see that person picking that number, so it wouldn't happen. We cannot see like him. He don't expect us to see what he sees. I'm glad when you, maybe this week you've messed up, maybe you've done something that you look back on and say, why in the world did I do that? Why did I fall for that? Listen to me. You can't see what God sees. You can't see in the future what that choice or that, that action is going to be, and God understands that. We can't see that. So you know what we got to do? Quit looking ahead and just look and see what we can see right now. Take it one hour at a time, one day at a time, and go forward for the glory of God. We can't see it. We're not God. I saw a movie, you, if you'll come and get a song of invitation. Many of you guys probably saw that movie, Face of the Giants, the Christian-based. Matter of fact, from down where Brother Weiss was in that area. In that movie, it's a movie about football, and they got a team, they got a good team, but they just can't get it together. They just don't kind of come together. They need a leader, they need a leader to rise up, but just don't seem like the team's making it. So they get this one kid out on the field, and and they blindfold him, and he gets down, and he's crawling. He puts a guy on his back, and he's crawling down through there. And, and he gets to about where he's going to fall, about where he's going to break. And the coach, you can see the movie. I mean, if you ain't seen it, the coach is down in his ears screaming and said, One more step. Well, I forgot exactly how he termed it. One, one more time. Step one more time. Keep going. He's screaming in his ear. Keep going. You're almost there. Keep going. And that kid just keeps wheelbarrow crawling and just keeps going that guy on his back and he's screaming the whole time and the whole every the team's cheering on and everybody's getting excited now they're all screaming and the kid's about to fall again he says don't do it let's go suck it up let's go he just keeps on crawling keeps on crawling he gets to where the kid can't even crawl no more and he just collapses out of strength he pulls that face mask off and that kid has crawled all the way down to the goal line. And he can't believe it. <laughs> he can't believe it that he actually done it. And the team's looking around and said, he just, did he just do that? Did he? And basically through the movie, a superstar is born. But you know what? Just like that kid on that football team, you and I don't know what the future holds. We can't see what's out there and we can't even really sometimes see how far we've gone. But just like that kid, you keep pressing and you keep going and making that next step. The finish line's coming. Hey friend, the finish line is soon to be here. Just because we can't see it don't mean we ain't fixing to cross it. might take one more barrel roll one more strain one more power of the will to keep on going God don't expect us to know the end of his leading he just expects us to follow his leading just to keep going let's stand heads are bowed and eyes are closed just for a moment Father we love you we thank you Lord for the word Sometimes in my own Christian life, I'm overwhelmed, Lord, about what I should do and what I need to do. Sometimes it's out of my hands. I want to do so much, but I have to consider that I'm not God. And I can only do so much. There are times in our life, Lord, as you well know, is all we can do is stand still and know 
Stand still and know that you are God and we are not. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that's in some troubled waters and a uh, a troubled storm. All they know is just to hold on. All they know is to take that next walk, that next step. I pray, God, for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that you would lift them up. And even if they can't see that next step, they go ahead and go with your leading. Go ahead and stand with your touch. Lord, bless the simple thought tonight. Use it for your glory. You've helped me, Lord, just in reading these things and realizing, Lord, there's some things that I just can't fix. Some things that are out of my control, out of my reach, out of my understanding, way beyond my intellect, Lord. But as a brother shared on Sunday morning, you are the Lord and you change not. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you do. We'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you need to come, you come. Watch the your love of God. Prayer requests will be known at this time. Certainly pray for Brother Richard. Continue to pray for him. And also Brother Jesse in the passing of his aunt. Let's continue to pray. Pray for the Crowder family there. Anybody else got a need? Miss Joanne? Amen. Let's remember these needs. Anybody else? Remember this. Anybody else? Okay. 
is haunt. Yeah. I got you. Anybody else? Amen. Remember your family. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If our land is, boy, there's forest fires everywhere. Amen. Let's pray for these. Anybody else? Two babies. Just remember this. Amen. Anybody else? Let's pray for our church. Pray that God will direct and lead us and guide us and bless and uh, pray for all those children out there. That God will touch and uh, instill God's word in them. Amen. All unspoken prayer requests. Amen. Let's, if you would, let's gather around the altar and we'll close out in prayer tonight.